That is the current Eastern Elf facility. So trying to help them now to get some storage in place and the food will come in, we know. Shock and then devastation. Campus Food Bank, as well as all the other food banks, really rely on the Community Food Sharing Association. We may have to scale back what we give in our hampers to make things go further. Very quickly, we all worked together and uh, came up with the Food for Vines in an effort to try to get back some of those food donations that were lost. Taking stock and taking donations. Tonight, we're looking at the fallout from yesterday's fire at the Community Food Sharing Association's warehouse and how the people of this province are trying to help. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain, live here at Pippi Place outside what is likely the new location of the Food Sharing Association after yesterday's destructive fire. Now, this used to be a property that belonged to Eastern Health. I'm going to bring in here and now is Carolyn Stokes, essentially explain why we are here tonight. Carolyn. Well, Anthony, yes, uh, this used to be a kitchen uh, used by Eastern Health, but it's not in use anymore. So now it looks like it could be the new warehouse for the Community Food Sharing Association. Now, Premier Dwight Ball met with Egg Walters today at the site of the warehouse fire. He was there to help on two fronts. First, to help the association find a new warehouse, something they desperately need because with all the food donations coming in, there's just nowhere to put it right now. And the premier says government is also helping with a cash donation, $50,000 to help replace some equipment destroyed by the fire. The cause, and you add the response to the cause, and it's unfortunate that we find ourselves in this situation today, but Mr. Walters and his group, they've done a remarkable job of two community response for many years now, so it's important for us to get in. And I'm not surprised at all with the, the response that we have within the communities, and I think that will continue to grow in the next few days, but getting a place, getting a storage facility, uh, getting, making that available to them, all of this works. This man needs a place to store the food that will come in because Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, they always respond in this way. So we had to give him a location where it's secure and something that works for him. That's really critical. That's, a, that's our number one priority now is to get, get space where we, we'll be able to accept the food donations and get them boxed up and sent out to food banks across the province. Now, I spoke with Egg Walters just a short time ago, and uh, he told me that this afternoon he toured this facility and says uh, that it is workable. It definitely suits their needs, so he's ready to go, but there's still some bureaucratic paperwork that needs to go through. So when that goes through, he's hoping that they'll get to take the keys and move in. And also, Anthony, uh, this afternoon we heard from the police, and they gave us an update on the cause of the fire, and they say that it looks like it was not suspicious, that it was uh, like Likely caused uh, by electrical. Okay. It was electrical well, fire. Yeah. The, one of the key questions lurking was all of that. So that's that's good news if there is any good news. Carolyn, mm -hmm. thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, if you're watching here and now last night, hard to believe how so much has happened in 24 hours. We were coming to you live from Mount Pearl from the former warehouse, and you might recall seeing those boards there covering up the fact that almost four truckloads of food had been destroyed by smoke and water and all the efforts to put out that fire. As I mentioned, a lot has happened. I'm going to bring in that here now is Mark Quinn uh, to talk about just what has happened over those past 24 hours. Mark. Well, Anthony, of course, we've heard a lot about the problems that this has caused, but today I spoke with some people who are actually trying to solve those problems, and here's one of them. Oh my goodness, as soon as we put it up on social media, it has just been all over the place. People are asking us all kinds of questions. People are calling and asking questions and coming in and dropping off a few things as well. So already it's starting to gain a lot of traction. Here's something you don't usually see in a library. But when people here heard about the food warehouse disaster, they jumped into action. First thing this morning, they all got together and they said, what can we do to help this other um, important community institution? So um, very quickly, we all worked together and uh, came up with the food for fines. And here's how it works. Bring some food donations along when you bring back your overdue books and the library forgives your late fines. Hopefully some people too that um, have felt a little hesitant about coming back to the library because they do have fines, maybe they'll come back to us now too. Times of need, people of, uh, people of our region and, and the province step up and help out and this is just another example. Across town at City Hall, Mayor Danny Breen is calling on community members across the Avalon to help their neighbours. A number of municipalities on Northeast Avalon have events coming up, their winter, uh, their winter family events, 
And so with each one of those, we'll be t taking donations for the food bank. Uh, so that'll be from, uh, from Paradise, St. John's, Mount Pearl, all the municipalities coming together. And uh, we'll be then uh, passing that food donations along to, uh, to Egony's group. So Mayor Danny Breen is uh, confident that with all these people pulling together, we are going to get uh, a lot of donations coming in from all over the Northeast Avalon and the province. And uh, he's betting, and in fact, we'll have more in the end than we lost in this fire. And Anthony, let's hope he's right. All right, Mark Quinn, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we'll have more later on here now, but just a reminder for those of you who've been asking, certainly seen a lot on social media, how can I help? Well, all you have to do, you can go to our website, we'll help you actually make your donation. And they prefer cash because... Obviously, having lost the warehouse, it makes things much easier as things are still in flux. So go to our website, cbc.ca slash nl. Look for the big, you can't miss it. It's on our community page. Big donate now. You click on that and that'll head you on your way. And whatever you can give, it's definitely something that the Food Association is going to appreciate. We'll have more later. Thanks so much, Anthony. And we will check back with you and Carolyn in just a little while. Well, organizers behind the Bridges of Hope Food Bank in St. John's are hoping people will donate directly to their effort and other community-based food banks. Manager Jody Williams says Bridges to Hope has the busiest food bank in the city. About 1,000 people go there a month. It only received about 20% of its food from the Community Food Sharing Association. But Williams says many surrounding food banks are completely reliant on the organization. He fears those food banks will run out and Bridges to Hope will be inundated with people who need uh, and they won't be able to help them. Hopefully some of the money and some of the things that people are raising can come directly to us to help us deal with that. I don't know how long it's going to take for the Food Sharing Association to uh, work out the logistics. It might take a month, I don't know. So like my hope, yeah, is to uh, raise some money yourself and to get some food drives going. Despite its distance from the community food sharing facility in St. John's, people in Labrador are also feeling the impact of yesterday's fire. That's because the warehouse is a place to turn when things get tight for the food bank in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Today, our Jacob Barker checked in with them. Well, it's not an everyday reliance, but for folks here in Happy Valley Goose Bay, a fire at the St. John's facility means the loss of a safety net. They know when supplies of food or cash get low, they have the support of the Community Food Sharing Association. It's always nice to know that um, they're there if we need them and we can call upon them and knowing right now they're not that we can't call upon them um, that that's just it's heartbreaking Maloney says the food bank here has been struggling because the need has increased and increased a lot in recent years she says the community is generous and rallies anytime they put a call out she knows that the fire at the St. John's facility will hamper the food bank's ability to help individuals and their families, but she wants St. John's to know that Goose Bay is still here to support in any way it can. The message we have for them right now is that we're thinking of them. Um, Egg and his team of staff and volunteers work so tirelessly to, uh, to be able to provide what they provide within our province. So just to let them know that we're thinking of them and if there's any way we can help that they can call upon us and we'll see what we can do. Well, at times like this, it becomes very apparent the important role that the Community Food Sharing Association plays in just about every corner of the province, even here, about 1,500 kilometers away. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Just a month ago, Maine opened up its first food bank. Today, the group said the Community Food Sharing Association has been essential for its success, saying Egg Walters and his team gave them advice on how to get started and have been their main source for food donations. The Maine Food Bank tells CBC News it is a loss for the whole province as they help so many of us in need. We hope people come together to help them in their time of need. Community Food Sharing is our backup plan. They're our insurance, They're, they have our back. Central Newfoundland also relies on the support from the Community Food Sharing Association. Here and Now's Garrett Barry brings you that story later on Here and Now. 
Well, the first half of the day today was quite lovely through parts of the province. Those temperatures, though, are about to drop like a rock. We're going to see those cold temperatures return to most of the province, uh, specifically up through Labrador, where there is an extreme cold warning for western Labrador. Temperatures dipping into the minus 30s overnight with wind chills feeling closer to minus 50. And then because of that colder air, I've been talking about this for the past couple days and it's already happening. Starting to see that snow squall set up and it looks like it will continue through Saturday. In some of these snow squall areas, we could see amounts upwards of 30 centimeters by the time Saturday rolls around. I'll have all those details in your full details in your full forecast when I come back. Deb? Well, there was a serious accident in Clarenville today. A woman from that town was killed in a head-on crash this afternoon. It happened at a main intersection near Memorial Drive and Manitoba Drive. Another person was taken to hospital with injuries. No word on their condition. Police say the investigation is ongoing. In political news, the provincial government says it's ready to create a standalone serious incident response team. That means that police will no longer investigate other police and that this province won't rely on outside agencies to investigate local officers. There are currently five cases in this province being investigated by other police forces or serious incident response teams across Canada. Four involve the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. The fifth is the RCMP. Now, any new cases of possible police wrongdoing will be investigated by the Newfoundland and Labrador CERT team. As for who will run the office, the Justice Minister says the job is posted, but says that person who is hired will need a Bachelor of Law degree, and depending on the case, extra investigators will also be hired. Estimating, you know, you could have up to 25 cases a year. Depending on the, reason, uh, the, the need, we have the ability to go out and hire extra civilian uh, investigators, and that could be uh, it's funny, I've had interest expressed from, you know, uh, former CSIS people, people that have done investigations in their past life, they're retired from that job now, uh, police officers, security forces, military, that'll depend on the need. The big thing now is to get the civilian director in. We know that we've got the resources coming in. been some big changes on the Northeast Avalon over the years, but the overall development plan for the region hasn't kept up with the times. Work to update that plan began 10 years ago and was never finished. Tonight, CBC Investigates takes a look at what happens now and why it matters. Here's St. John's was a very different place in the 1970s. Not as many people, not as many cars, not as much development roads like these in the center of the city. But one thing has stayed the same. The same regional development plan for the Northeast Avalon is still in place today. The effort that we're into right now is how do you update that and make it more relevant to today's society because we're 40 years down the road. 40 years down the road, but still following the same vision. The latest section of the Team Guju Highway just opened last month. The plan that identified the need for this road goes back decades. That land had been set aside for some kind of transportation link for 30 odd years and we knew we were going to need something eventually, that's what the plan was telling us. If we hadn't set that land aside, there would be no Team Guju Highway, there'd be no way to connect across the way we're doing now. So these plans are really, really important for long term planning. Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador has been working with the province, towns and cities for the past few years. In fact, the process has been on again, off again for a decade. I'd like to get it done within the next few months. Graham Leto's job will be to get everyone on side, to come up with a new plan for the next few decades. He was involved the last time this process was relaunched two years ago, before it was put on the shelf again because of municipal elections. But Leto says this time will be different. Most of the work has been completed. It's just a matter of bringing the new players up to speed and uh, get on with it. Fifteen cities and towns on the Northeast Avalon are involved in the project. They're looking at everything from land use to transportation links in the region over the next few decades. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. I had tubes hanging out of my arms and I was making this record and, and uh, it was the only time where I didn't think about it. 
Paul Brace poured his soul into his first album at the lowest point in his life, his battle with a deadly cancer. Now he's an ECMA nominee. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. And welcome back to Here and Now. We enjoyed some beautiful sunshine today, Ashley. It was lovely. And warm temperatures. It's pretty warm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, through part, most of the island saw these uh, nice temperatures. If you take a look at what we saw today is daytime highs above zero. So three degrees in St. John's and then through parts of central, similar temperatures. Then along the west coast, uh, between one and two degrees. Look at that. Happy Valley Goose Bay reached a high near minus two today. Same up through Nain and most of the Labrador coast, but those temperatures have dropped like a rock already and will continue to do so as we head through the night tonight. Take a look already sitting at minus 11 for Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus nine in Corner Brook, and then we're starting to flirt with a zero degree mark as we head towards the Avalon. Now, wind chills tonight will also be a factor as we start to get into uh, some windy conditions up through Labrador City and then heading through the night tonight. Could see those wind chills dipping down to about feeling more like minus 50. And then temperatures, or rather wind chill values, uh, feeling closer to the minus 20s through most of Newfoundland and then towards 
the Avalon into the mid minus teens through the overnight tonight. And then that is exactly what we're going to see as we head through the day tomorrow. So not much in the way of relief. So we do have that extreme cold warning in place for Lab City uh, and then towards Churchill as uh, Churchill Falls as well. So extreme cold warning looking at wind chills between minus 45 and minus 50 as I mentioned. And then if we take a look at the uh, satellite radar, we can start to see uh, the lake effect bands. Now, as these colder temperatures move in and over the water, that's when we start to see that snow squall set up. And we've been anticipating that for the past couple of days, and that's definitely starting to set up. So we're seeing all of that snow squall activity along the west coast right now. Environment Canada does have warnings along the coast down through uh, the Beeren Peninsula and then the Avalon right now is under a snow squall watch and that's because we could see these snow squalls develop at times right into Saturday it looks like. Now locally 5 to 10 centimeters is possible with each of these squalls. They are isolated in nature and tend to move with the wind so that will determine how much uh, snow you're going to see but we could see upwards of about 30 centimeters with some of these squalls by the time Saturday rolls around. So here's a look at the temperatures tonight. Minus uh, double digits overnight. The Avalon closer to the minus uh, minus single digit range and then generally looking at that southwesterly wind. So anywhere from 50 to 80 kilometer per hour winds is expected as we head through the night tonight. So that combined with those squalls leading to whiteout conditions right along the west coast. Up through Labrador again dipping down minus 32 looking at that slight chance of flurries through the day. But then tomorrow doesn't look all that bad. So if we take a look at the satellite radar, you can see all of those snow squalls potentially moving through and continuing through the day on Friday or through the day tomorrow. Up through Labrador, it'll be more of an isolated mix, so uh, some sun and cloud through the day. And that's the case through the island as well. You know, most of the day will be a mix of sun and cloud. Then when you see those squalls move through, they'll be quick. And then that's uh, when those temperature or rather the uh, whiteout conditions will occur. And again, we're going to see that continue right into Saturday. So here's a look at this. Temperatures are going to stay cold, minus single digits through the day along the west coast, colder near the minus double digits. But again, those westerly winds upwards of about 60 to 80 kilometers per hour through the day right across the province for the most part, even up through Labrador as well. Uh, so wind chills definitely feeling into the minus 30s with those daytime highs closer to the minus teens towards the coast. So that's a look at your forecast. We'll look ahead when I come back. Deb. Thanks, Ashley. Am I going to be alive to hear this? Well, that's what Paul Brace was thinking while he was recording his first solo album. A little over a year ago, at the age of 33, he was diagnosed with late stage cancer and he wasn't sure he was going to make it. But he did. And just this week, his album Liars and Actors was nominated for an East Coast Music Award in the Inspirational Recording of the Year category. choose to stay alive wonderful paul <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so this is where you recorded your studio album your very first um what was that process like when you were fighting stage four hodgkin's lymphoma it was a really scary experience um before that i was a pretty healthy guy i was into fitness i was into working out and i was into eating well most of the time so to get a diagnosis like stage four cancer was pretty devastating to me and my family and my friends no one really knew what to say there was weeks that went by where i was absolutely speechless it was terrifying but when you get a diagnosis like that you kind of kick into survival mode and you're just like i need to eradicate this from my body and that's the way i thought until i got really sick and had a scare and then I decided enough's enough. I'm gonna make this solo album that I've procrastinated making for years and years and years. So why, why though did you decide you you were sick as anything? Yeah. And you decide to do this, why? Well, as you can tell, I live on top of a recording studio <laughs> and I'm always recording other people's music. And I had my father and my friends saying, man, you gotta make this solo album. Every now and then, you know, after a glass of wine, I would show a song. And whether my father or my friends they would say, you really should do a solo record. I didn't really have the confidence to do something like that. It really 
felt like my calling was playing with other people, being a, a member of a band. But cancer focused. Cancer you. gave me the, basically, once I got diagnosed with cancer, one of the most important thing to me was time. And I felt like I was running out, running out of time. And I had my friends and my mu musician friends and my family rallying behind me to, yes, let's make this record. Nothing like a deadline to focus your mind. <laughs> exactly. This record was made by a guy who was convinced, not thought, he, I was convinced I was going to die. Wow. Tell me about the process. So you're, you're down here making your album. Mm -hmm. You were sick. Like, what, what was that like? Everyone was always on an uh, on-call basis. So I would go and get chemo, and I would uh, let everyone know if I was good to record. I, you know, often would do sessions wearing a surgical mask, wow. which is why I use that front cover of me wearing a surgical mask. There's a lots of lots of more meaning on that front cover besides me wearing a surgical mask. And uh, I also had a um, porta pick in my arm, and it went from both arms due to infection. So I had tubes hanging out of my arms, and I was making this record, and and. Uh, it was the only time where I didn't think about cancer. We didn't talk about sickness. Though we were writing songs that were heavily involved in the theme of questioning your mortality, life, death, what comes after, uh, questioning faith, and all these things in the record and in the theme of the record, we never really talked about it. We just were a group of friends making something really special and we just made a really, really cool and special record that I'll listen to and be proud of the rest of my life. <laughs> You have received this ECMA nomination yes. in the inspirational category. Hey, crazy, right? <laughs> what do you think the jury heard? What, what is speaking to them about this music of yours? Well, I think this is the, might be, you know, I might be wrong. It might be within the last couple of years, but they changed the category from gospel to inspirational. And that's because they wanted to include albums that evoked, you know, inspirational feelings and stuff like that. And I think E.C. Mays looked at my album and realized, you know, this is a guy who was really writing from his heart. And I wrote this album for young adults and their families affected by cancer. That's the first thing that's in the liner notes. This is dedicated to young adults and their families affected by cancer. Uh, and I have so many young adults and, you know... Um, full-on adults, I guess, uh, messaging me all the time saying, you know, I'm going through cancer treatment, I listened to your album and it really inspired me and I think it's really cool that you had the energy to make something for yourself but also for other people. I do give a portion of the proceeds from the physical sales of Liars and Actors back to Young Adult Cancer Canada and that's an organization that uh, really helped in my recovery. And, um, and they tell me all the time that, you know, it's a, it's a really ins inspirational story. I'm just really proud and honored that people consider my album inspirational. <laughs> and uh, I'll continue to do what I do and hope to inspire people. And that's, that's all I can wish for. Well, would you do us the honor of playing us out? I, sure, I certainly can. This is the last song on the album. It's called Halfway There. Warm your hands on the fire take it in and drink it down tell me stories about what you stole and what you found there's a cabin on the side of water halfway from where you've been Meet me there so I can jump them all and let me in. Something in the water, something in the air. Don't get restless now, cause we're just halfway there. Uh, we may have to scale back what we give in our hampers to make things go further. The Single Parents Association received a shipment of food just before yesterday's warehouse fire. But how long will it last?
Welcome back to Here and Now, live at Pippi Place, outside what should in the very near future be the home of the Food Sharing Association after yesterday's fire. A lot has happened. Carolyn Stokes has been staying on top of that. So let's go through some of the reaction to, to this horrible event yesterday. Oh, yeah, the, and so much reaction, Anthony. It really is amazing. And we've been talking about all of the people, the groups, the businesses that have really come together to show support for the Community Food Sharing okay. Association. And I wanted to start with a, a little bit of an update on the financial contributions that the Food Sharing Association has received so far. So, you know, we always hear about Newfoundlanders and Labradorians being very giving and very charitable mm -hmm. and uh, over the past 35 hours and under 35 hours really $100,000 in donations have come wow. through for the Food Sharing Association and on top of that yep. the $50,000 that the provincial government is going to be contributing so okay. $150,000 since yesterday. All right that certainly sounds substantial. Yeah going to go a long way to helping them mm -hmm. with uh, damaged equipment and stuff like yep. that. Get back so. on their feet. Absolutely, yeah. and uh, you know some of the groups that have been helping. Uh, Newfoundland Power is organizing a province-wide food drive, and uh, it donated ten thousand dollars to the Food Sharing Association. And the English School District is also donating ten thousand dollars. And uh, also, uh, if you're heading down to Mile One tonight to see the basketball game, the St. John's Edge uh, is uh, asking that you bring a food item with you, and if you do, you'll get your ticket for ten dollars, oh, okay. and you'll go into a draw for uh, a future tickets uh, yeah. all right so the basketball teams get involved in this as well yeah absolutely so lots of people coming together as I say and uh, you know of course if you're thinking about donating something uh, non-perishable food items are always welcome but cash is really good for them because right. then they can just buy what they need and they have such buying power they can make uh, that money go a long yeah, way because so, of the volume that they, they buy yeah, things in right absolutely bulk buying so even the smallest donation can go a long way right all right Carolyn thank you very much thank you here now is Carolyn Stokes and obviously as Carolyn pointed out um, the whole root of this story is the loss and destruction of a warehouse so cash really is king in this instance so as much as uh, per uh, non-perishable food items I mean they're still going to be re required once they get up and running of course go back that way but right now if you can make a cash donation that's probably the most helpful way uh, to show your support now early in the show Jacob Barker showed you what the situation is in the big land with the impact of what happened going to go to central Newfoundland now where there people are also trying to figure out how they can best cope in the short term at least because of yesterday's fire Garrett Barry reports as far as food banks go, this is a pretty sleek operation. Sales from here help the pantry here. At a partnership with a local grocery store, and you're in pretty good shape. But still, sometimes you just can't make ends meet. There's over 100 families involved, so that's per month, per month. and many children involved in that as well. That's where the Community Food Sharing Association comes in. I probably close to a full pallet of uh, boxes with canned items and then there were uh, cases of things like cereal bars, granola bars which we could use for kids snacks. It helped smooth the transition from the generous holiday season to the slow spring. February and March coming up which is the hardest months on uh, food banks and food drives we would have uh, been availing of them again in the next month for sure. In Botwood the food bank also runs a self-sustaining operation. They've got their own partnership with a food distributor, but they relied on the food sharing network for years and still have that support. Community food sharing is our backup plan. They're our insurance. They're, they have our back. We run out of food, pick up the phone, food is on the way. If you're feeding hungry families, that goes a long way. Uh, it, it gives you peace of mind. It, it's, it's assurance. It's, it's, I mean, we're pretty much self-sufficient right now. But it's only for us to lose our contact and we're back to where we were before. That safety blanket is down, but the hungry families are still here. Right now, those food banks have pretty full shelves and they believe if supplies drop, that their community will step up again with even more donations. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Botwood. Well, another group that, of course, that relies on food banks are single parents. I mean, the divorce and the breakdown of the relationship is just a fact of life. And if you are a single parent, every now and then a food bank can, of course, be a lifeline. It just so happens that yesterday, just hours before that fire, the Single Parents Association got a shipment of food. But just how long is that going to last? Zach Gowdy has that angle of this story. 
Ms. Paulson, when did you guys receive this shipment of food from the Community Food Sharing Association? We were very lucky. Uh, our food pickup was always on Tuesday. However, uh, we don't know what's going to happen next week. You know, we go through food. We do a pickup every week because we go through food that fast. Oh, sure. Yeah. So all of this food was picked up yesterday before the fire? Before the fire. Yes, it was. Wow. But you won't see, like, this goes in, in two days. It's got, you know, it's gone because we have so many families coming in. You know, 150 single parent families with over 300 people. It can certainly go very quickly. So this food will be distributed within a week? Within a week. Next week will be one, you know, we don't know where, what's going on because we haven't been told yet the uncertainty of the situation, of course. So much has been worked out with the warehouse and things like that. So. I mean, there's food banks, for example, we're picking up on Wednesday and Thursday, even today, that they're not getting food. So what are you telling your clients as you're supplying them with this food this week about right. what could happen? Well, could happen is we may have, you know, next week, we're not sure until the circumstances get worked out. Uh, we may have to scale back what we give in our hampers to make things go further. Or, you know, hopefully it won't come to it, but we may have to have like a day that we won't have the food bank actually open until community food sharing gets back on its feet again. Uh, you know, Ms. Balsam, I know that everybody who works here and does this kind of work does it because they really care about yes. it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how did you feel when you found out that you were, you had made this pick up just before this devastating fire? Well, just getting the news yesterday was, was heartbreaking. It was just such a shock. And I can certainly uh, empathize with how Egg must be feeling because it's devastating to know that you have these people depending on you. And, you know, I'm, maybe next week we might have to look at some people when we come in for food hampers and say, we don't have the food to give you. Oh I'm sorry. So what can people who are hearing this interview do to help out? I know it, lots of places, organizations, mm -hmm. people are rolling up their sleeves to try to fix this situation. Right. What do people do to help you guys? Well, what they can do to help us is they could drop off food donations directly to us at our location, 472 Logan Bay Road, because uh, 99% 0.9% of our food comes from community food sharing. We get a little bit from a person who walks in every now and then. But what they can do is drop in with a bag here and there or gift cards or monetary. We can use all of those things to make sure we got food on our shelves for all the single parent families that are going to be approaching us for their hampers. Well, you just heard how you can actually make donations directly for single parent, the Single Parents Association. But back to the Food Sharing Association, which is really the root uh, at this whole story, the, the heart of the food distribution um, through the body of our province. You can go online. So just a reminder before I wind things down here at uh, Pippi Place, go to our website, cbc.ca slash NL. And when you find the community page, you'll see a big red insignia. You can't miss it, that emblem there, donate now. Click on that and that'll set you on your way and you can make a donation. Debbie? Much, Anthony, and uh, it is easy to donate, and already a lot of people are doing just that. So much has happened yes. in just a little over 24 hours. Very positive out of this negative story, for sure. Yeah, it certainly is. Thanks so much, Anthony. Yeah, See you tomorrow. Is. Okay. At 108 years old, he may be the oldest person in the Maritimes. See his birthday party next.
And welcome back to Here and Now. At 108 years old, he may be the oldest person in Atlantic Canada. He has 25 great-grandchildren and five great-great-grandchildren. Here's how Arnold Hawkins spent his special day. Happy birthday! Same to you! Same to me! <laughs> You're 108 today. Who? You! 108? Yeah, you are. What do you think of that? He was born in 1911, January 30th, 1911, uh, right here in Beaver Harbor. He grew up here. He went to school just down here beside his, beside his place. Um, and then he, he worked here. He fished out of here. So he's been in Beaver Harbor his whole life. Grant was a very hard worker, and he took care of his family. He was just like, he was such a good dad and everything and took care of his family and just, he's just, he's just been amazing. He's, he's a, he's a great guy. He's very kind, very, very kind. When you were a little boy, daddy, what did you used to play? Their marriage, oh my gosh. They were just, they were never apart. Only when he was out fishing and she would be home, but they never, everything they did, they did together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Arnold, happy birthday to you. Dad, how about a kiss? Huh? How about a kiss? Who? Me. <laughs> Get a hug too? <laughs> hug two, hug three. Hug three. <laughs> well. The two young railway fanatics doing their bit to keep Newfoundland railway history alive. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. This weather update is brought to you by 
Beltone, helping the world hear better. Welcome back. It is Thursday, which means we're all looking forward to the forecast for the weekend, but it also means something else, Ashley. <laughs> it does. It's another Weather Whiz Kid Club member. We take a look at that. It is Willa Petten today. So she is our newest member. This is her photo Aww. that she uh, sent us from grade one from uh, primary school. Beautiful uh, picture there of a snowman. There's her little picture in the corner there yeah. too. So welcome to the club. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have any drawings that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca with the name, how old the child is, and a picture as well as your address so that I can send you one of those uh, club card memberships They're in the really mail. cool cards. <laughs> they are, aren't they? <laughs> so uh, we are, as I said, we're approaching the weekend. How are things shaping up for Saturday? Well, Saturday actually doesn't look all that bad overall. I mean, we are going to see a mix of sun and cloud through uh, most of the island, even into Labrador as well. But we are still in that southwesterly flow, which means we could see that potential for snow squalls through the day and that will continue through most of the day. You can see this model really not picking up on it, but we are still looking at that potential along the west coast, south coast, and then even for parts of the Avalon, we could see that potential through the day, but those temperatures are gonna stay quite cool as well. Up through Labrador, generally looking at uh, fair skies, some cloud cover moving in late day, and then with that, we could see the risk of a few flurries as well into Sunday. So here's a look at the forecast. We're going to stay quite chilly again. These temperatures really not moving much over the next couple of days. Uh, minus 10 for Corner Brook, minus 7 for Grand Falls. Winds are heading towards the Avalon. Uh, similar temperatures in the minus single digits through the day. Again, a mix of sun and cloud with that risk of uh, snow squalls through the day. Up through Labrador, another chilly one for Lab City. Warmer than um, what we're going to see through the overnights though. Those temperatures dipping to the minus 30s. And then for the rest of Labrador, generally sitting in the minus teens through the day. Again, a mix of sun and cloud, slight chance of a few flurries in the mix there as well. So looking ahead into overnight Saturday, we start to see a system move in. So the potential for snow squalls won't be snow squalls as much. It'll be uh, the potential for some snow for parts of the Avalon, and that's because a system just skirts south of us. Uh, but we could see that potential for snow, but lingering um, Onshore flurries expected for the west coast up through Labrador, though, on Sunday. Everything looks like it should clear out just a few mix of uh, sun and cloud. And then into Monday afternoon, another system rolls through. Potentially, that's where we could continue to see these uh, potential for some snow through Monday and generally gray through the day and then another system as we head into Tuesday as well. So it does look like we're more into that snow potential and then even the potential for some freezing rain along the south coast and the Avalon as Tuesday rolls around or rather Wednesday rolls around. So here's a look at the forecast over the next five days for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. That potential for squalls, as I mentioned, right through Saturday and then gray generally for Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Those temperatures will eventually climb up as we start to see that um, next couple of systems roll through, but still sitting below zero right through Tuesday. And then for central Newfoundland, again, a mix of sun and cloud, it looks like right through Sunday, but can't rule out some isolated squalls moving through. And then Monday, mix of sun and cloud and minus seven. Western Newfoundland, same thing, snow squalls and windy, that's the best chance. And then up through Labrador. Temperatures sitting in the minus teens through Tuesday, and then for Western Labrador, we're going to sit around the minus 20s. Slight chance of a few flurries, generally fair skies as we head into Sunday. And then by the time Tuesday rolls around, we'll get into some warmer temperatures. So just look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I come back. Deb. Thanks, Ashley. More now on the province's plan to create a standalone serious incident response team. It means police in this province will no longer have to turn to outside forces to investigate its officers. There was some talk about a possible Atlantic Canada-wide CERT unit. Here's Justice Minister Andrew Parsons explaining why the unit is needed and why the province decided to go it alone. The fact is that we, we have these incidents and we want to impart confidence uh, in our citizens and confidence in our police forces. I have full faith in it, uh, but when you have serious incidents that arise, people want to know that there's independent civilian-led observation and investigations done to ensure that integrity is maintained. Uh, 
these things happen. I mean, we, given the fact that we have some of these that have gone through the court route, it shows that we uh, that we need that oversight. Uh, and we went through a period of time there where I think that there were, you know, just going by the calls that I would get the emails, the public commentary, where people were seeming to, to lose faith in whether, you know, police could investigate their own. And you can't have that. Once you have that appearance, even if it's just perception, it creates that fear in people that we don't want. Right now, I don't have that. We've had the civilian oversight since we've been here. Uh, now we're going to solidify that with our own team going forward. Uh, our police forces are behind it. And uh, you know, the anecdote I always tell is I ran into an officer one day getting out of the plane. And this is when we were first talking about it, it was roughly three years ago. And this officer said, you know, I support it <coughs> because I know I do good work and I want I have no problem with somebody overseeing that and it just lets everybody know. And so when you hear that from a, an officer, that gives you an idea you're on the right path. How does Newfoundland compare to the rest of uh, Atlantic Canadian provinces when it comes to numbers? So we have five cases. Um, is that comparable in other locations similar size say, to us? Uh, given the fact that New Brunswick and Nova Scotia don't have their own, they rely on Nova Scotia. Uh, I don't have those numbers. I think that we may be lower than Nova Scotia, but that just primarily comes down to a size thing. You look at the number of members that we have here compared to the numbers of, the number of members that are in Nova Scotia. The bigger the force, uh, the bigger the population, the more numbers that you're going to have. It's just a numbers game. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, since last year, uh, you know, once Ronald McDonald left and went to BC, he had been a big help to us, and he was a big name in civilian oversight in Canada. Uh, once he left, they, you know, they went through a period where they had an interim director, that now they have a new one in. Uh, we, we knew that we needed, if we were going to make this happen, we wanted to happen soon. I mean, whenever you're trying to collaborate with four other, or three other provinces, four provinces trying to make something happen, mm -hmm. it's a good thing, but it was delaying us. And we've said that this is a priority. That's why we want to go ahead, go on our, on our own, and have this team up and running this year. The Calgary truck driver responsible for the Humboldt Broncos bus tragedy addressed the families of the victims at a sentencing hearing in Saskatchewan today. Jaskarat Singh Sidhu said he takes full responsibility for the deaths of 16 people and the injuries suffered by 13 others. He blamed the collision on his lack of driving experience. Sidhu's already pleaded guilty day to 29 for... counts of dangerous driving. Today, the Crown said he should serve 10 years in prison. It also asked for the maximum driving ban of 10 years. Sidhu's testimony follows three days of victim impact statements. Sidhu also faces deportation because he is not a Canadian citizen, and any sentence over six months would result in a removal order. The judge says sentencing will be announced on March 22nd. Well, here's a look at your weather oh. photo of the day. Doesn't this one look just, I mean, most of them do, but this one really looks like a painting. That is beautiful. Look at those ducks in the water there, too. <laughs> well, I'm sure you can't figure out where this no. photo's taken. <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll see the photo one more time, and I'll tell you where it was taken and who took it when we come back.
So we'll take a look at that uh, beautiful oh, weather photo lovely. one more time. And those ducks there, <laughs> it just kind of gets me in that picture yeah. of ducks in a row there. I love it. <laughs> so this photo was taken in Lanza Claire. Oh, lovely. Mm -hmm. And who took that? The photo was taken by Fabian Thomas. Oh, thanks so, so much, Fabian. Stunning, stunning sky there. I don't know whether that was a, a sunset or a sunrise. Either yeah. way, it was beautiful. Thank you so much for setting that in. And uh, thanks to you for being with us. And uh, you may have noticed there were a few gremlins in our system tonight. Thanks for your patience. Join us again tomorrow. Have a great night. Good night.